we are um, I think we are now live and um let's launch the session so welcome to the stay at home festival um we are beaming into you tonight from all over europe and uh, the panel is all uh, completely focused on Brit Brits abroad or British writers abroad. So we're going to be spending the next um, hour or so talking about our experiences as British writers in Europe. Um, and we'll be talking about various different themes. And I think the, the first thing we should do is uh, introduce ourselves. So I will pass uh, over to Tom. And if you want to tell us, Tom, who you are, what book you've written, uh, or books, and um, where you are. Tell us a little bit about where you are as well. Yeah, hi, I'm Tom Benjamin. I'm currently in Bologna, Italy, and uh, that's the setting for my um, uh, mystery series, um, which features an English detective, Daniel Lester. And the first book, um, which I just happen to have with me here, A Quiet Death in Italy, um, was published last year. And the second, The Hunting Season, is out um, next month. And each of the stories really um, follows the, um, the, the, the investigations of uh, my, my, my English detective as he, he tries to unravel the mysteries um, in the books. And also, I think, a bit of, he tries to unravel really also the mystery of Italy itself. And I think that was part of the motivation um, for, my, for my writing, my setting. And why did you move to Italy? Um, well, because I had to, by accident, really. Um, my wife was offered a job here, and I sort of came with the luggage. Um, <laughs> it wasn't planned. I was never an Ital it it Italfo a file, um, and um, so I found found myself here, and I also found myself with a subject, which was great. Fantastic, excellent. We'll look forward to hearing more about that, uh, Tom, and life in Bologna. Um, how about you, Caroline Bishop? Um, yep. Yeah. Hi, I'm Caroline, and um, I live in Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, I've been here since 2013, and my debut novel is The Other Daughter, which came out this February, and it's um, partly set in Switzerland and very much inspired by um, the the countryside and the issues and the the history of the country, which I've sort of discovered since I've been living here. <laughs> And why did you choose uh, Switzerland? Uh, well, similar to Tom, um, I followed my other half. Um, he had a job out here um, already, and it took me four years, but I finally decided to move over and join him. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Gillian Harvey. Hello, um, I'm Gillian Harvey, and um, my novel Everything is Fine was published last May, and I've got another one subtly in the background, Perfect on Paper, which is out in two weeks. And neither of my books are set in France where I live. Um, I don't really know why I might eventually set a book in France, but at the moment, even though I've been here a decade, I just don't feel I know the country well enough yet. The more I live here, the less I think I actually know about living here. So maybe that's on the cards in the future. Excellent. And why, what, what inspired you to move to France? Um, it's really embarrassing, really, because um, my husband and I were both teachers in the UK and um, we it was some holidays and we watched a lot of uh, Escape, to the, <laughs> Escape to the Sun or what is it, Home in the Sun or one, one of those, there's millions, aren't there? And we were thinking, wow, the property prices in France are really, really affordable. <laughs> and you start to think, I could live without a mortgage. <laughs> so um, it was kind of more running away than running towards. We, we moved very spontaneously um, and just... And I think if we had actually researched, we might not have come, which would have been a shame because there's lots of kind of admin hurdles and there's there's things that are good and things that are not so good. But we're really happy here now. And uh, so I'm glad I'm here. Excellent. And Catherine Kipper, you're also in France. Uh, yeah, I'm also in France. Um, my first book was The Chalet, um, which was out last year. Um, and then later this year, I have The Chateau. I have postcards there it's a bit shiny so you can't really see it but um 
they're both they're both set between France and London. Um, the chalet is set in a ski resort because I'm a big skier, and the chateau is kind of in a fictionalised version of where I live in the Ariège, which is in the south of France. Excellent. And what what took you to France? A um, little bit like Gillian. It was just sort of, um, well, partly it was that I wanted to ski more. Um, it was um, the kids were the right age to move. It just seemed um, seemed like a good idea to sell our little house in London and buy a big house in France and have the kids grow up bilingual, um, things like that, really. It wasn't massively well-researched, but it, um, it turned out quite well. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Look forward to hearing more about that. And Natasha, also in France, I believe. Yes, absolutely. I am not that far away, actually, from Lausanne, from, um, yeah, from one of you there, actually. I think um, we are, I'm also in the mountains. Um, we came just about a year ago, a bit more. Um, and we, in fact, came um, by accident. We came for a short time and then there was a lockdown, so we decided to stay, which was a little bit reckless, but we did it. We just did it because we're both freelance anyway, so we were just like, okay, do you know what? It's... Um, it's possible, so let's do it, why not? Um, so we're sort of accidental exiles. Um, and my <laughs> book is, uh, my book came out during this last year while, we were, while we've while we been here and it's called Love Orange. It came out last September. It's a novel set in America actually, because I'm half American. So it's nothing to do with anything um, French, but we're delighted to be here anyway. Fantastic. Um, oh, that leaves me. Uh, so I am Emma Christie. I'm not Spanish. You might have guessed. I'm Scottish um, and I live in Barcelona. This is my debut novel, The Silent Daughter, which is based in Edinburgh, but also has a, a few uh, a few references to Barcelona um, and Spain. And I moved here about six years ago. I returned, um, but I had been living in other parts of Spain for many, many years, and I've lived also in, in Latin America. Uh, basically, since uh, I started writing, I've never lived in Scotland. I've been all over the place. Uh, but I'm happily settled now in Barcelona and, uh, and and hope to stay. So so here we are, all over Europe, and um, writing books in English, for the primarily for the, the, the British market. Um, so now that we know who we are, we'll ask, how how does the place that you are how does it impact your writing and i'll start with you tom because i think you know i know you you had a long um a long road to publication and, and really it wasn't until you moved to italy i believe that the, the click it suddenly happened is that right yeah i think that's what it was all about really um i mean i wrote for years beforehand but i i recognize now that in a sense i was an author in search of a subject um you know my background's in journalism I don't think really the writing was ever a huge issue. It was actually coming up with something that, you know, was was enough and uh, su uh, sufficiently interesting to a publisher. And um, so, you know, when I came to Italy, again, I wasn't really thinking of writing a book set in Italy or about Italy. It came mainly from my own experiences, experiences, experiences of trying to live here. Um, uh, because my, my wife's Italian and I was very keen on, well, to be honest, in Bologna, there, is a, there isn't really an expat community, um, or at least there wasn't when we came here, I don't know, about 12, 14 years ago. And um, so you just had to integrate and you had to get on. Um, and so there was never any kind of option for me uh, to, to just sort of kind of live in a, in, in, in a sort of Anglo file community and so I had to get a, I had to get a job and I and, and I had to learn the language most of all and I didn't know any Italian whatsoever and I went to school for a, a few months but I didn't do very well there because it was basically me and a bunch of teenagers talking about going to the swimming pool or what have you how to get to the swimming pool I, I, I mastered that pretty well um, but then you kind of walk out onto the streets and then someone just kind of blurts something out to you and you're just I just don't know what you're saying and, and I wanted to work in Italy and I wanted to, to have, a, have another career here and, and so on. So I went to, um, I, I got a job basically on the door of a, of a, of a canteen for, for the poor. Um, and um, it was there really that I, I, I really had to pick up the language and I spent about a year working there. 
And it was the sort of, um, it was the, it was, it was actually being in this very, very different environment, which was not at all like the Italy that most people obviously go to Italy for, you know, they, they, go, they go to Italy for the beach and the ice cream and the culture. They don't go there to hang out in a canteen for the homeless. And um, so, so, so seeing a very, very, very different type of Italy in a kind of different type of Italian city, because Bologna really wasn't on the tourist map then, um, began to inspire me um, from, from a writing point of view. And, I, and, uh, and, and so for a while I kind of struggled around, well, how can I, how can I, how can I present this? Um, and because I also have a background um, with the police, I spent a couple of years um, working as a press officer for Scotland Yard. So I did have some sort of understanding of that world too. Over time, um, the idea of Daniel Lester, my English detective, you know, came to me and um, you know, my first actually, my first effort um, really didn't work out too much because it was actually too kind of grisly. I don't mean kind of in a kind of bloody way, but in a kind of it was really a lot about homeless people in Bologna, <laughs> and 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 I and I realised I had to kind of write more for the market. Um, but I do, you know, coming back to what Gillian said, in a sense, certainly my first Daniel Lester novel was very much about me unraveling the mystery of Italy as much as my, 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 narr my narrator, my narrator was unraveling the actual mystery in the story. And so it was a way for me to kind of get to know the Italian culture um, and get to know the Italy I was in, the Bologna I was in, the way it really worked as much as it was, you know, to tell the story. Yeah, and I, I found that when I was reading The Hunting Season, your, your second book, I think there was a couple of times I wrote to you and said, oh, I so know what you mean about, you know, and it's the, the, the country seen from the foreigner's perspective. And, and rather than uh, sort of running away from that, you, you embraced it completely with your character, which is great. What about you, Caroline? Because your book is also based in, in the place that you live, more or less, no? in, in, in Switzerland. Yeah, it's um, well, it's a dual timeline novel, and it's partly set in London and partly in Switzerland. Um, I guess similarly, I've got two two point of view characters, and both of them are English who come to Switzerland as English people and see the country from that sort of outsider view. Um, and I was thinking about that before this chat, and I don't think I'd ever really thought about that before. But I, I think that's probably why I wrote it was sort of reflecting my own position coming to live here as a, a foreigner and discovering this country and sort of thinking well what would it have been like to have grown up here how different would I be how um, you know would I have learned to ski from birth and I don't know kids here go hiking from the age of three and things like that and it sort of made me think well what how different would I be if I'd grown up in this country um, so yeah it very much came from it from that perspective um, and then I think um, I was a when I first came out, I was a journalist in the UK. And then when I first came out here, I was writing for um, uh, an Anglophone website out here, um, writing about Swiss news for the expat market, I suppose. Um, and through that, I started to learn a lot about Switzerland that I didn't know before. Um, I think like lots of people, you know, the sort of cliches of Switzerland, like the chocolate and the cows and, you know, the lakes and the mountains, and it definitely has all of that. But I discovered things that I didn't know so much about, like um, the fact that uh, women's rights here came quite late, really, that women got the vote at national level in 71. And there were quite a lot of um, issues that came after that date as well, quite late in comparison to other countries. Um, and then also other sort of historical issues about um, issues with the care, the foster care system, which I didn't know about previously. Um, things that I just found really fascinating. And that, I think, gave me the impetus to write this story sort of gave me a plot that I didn't really have before. We're quite similar in a way to to Tom's experience of sort of arriving to a place and and exploding it through your writing in many ways. Yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. What about you Catherine? A slightly different um, experience for you? Yeah I think actually mine is quite different because particularly the chalet um, it's set in a ski resort and it's um, while there are some people I think there's yeah, but I think there's one person who's a permanent resident in the book of the... Um, so really, it's about holiday makers and people who are quite transient. 
Um, so while, you know, like the seasonal workers, you know, they'll only be there for a season or two. So while obviously they're in France, um, there's less about fitting in or um, all that kind of thing. Um, the Chateau, um, probably a little bit more like um, Tom and Caroline are talking about, but again, not a huge amount. And to be honest, it's partly because um, for me, I find it quite hard to include French people in the novel because of the language thing. I kind of think not everybody speaks French, so I don't want to I don't want to put in too many French phrases. Um, but, but at the same time, it's kind of weird to have a French person who's speaking English too much. So I, I do have some that are there. Um, but yeah, I think there's, um, I mean, there's a little bit about, um, there are actually, there's a, there is one thing in the Chateau, which is, it sounds very boring, but it's about inheritance law in, um, in France, which I was absolutely amazed by when I got here, how kind of restricted it is, which is actually quite a big plot point in my book, it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, so yeah, there's some elements of that, but it's very much set in an expat bubble so it's not really about fitting in or anything like that just because I kind of found it easier from a writing point of view to do it that way. Yep, really interesting and Gillian um, you've you've gone to, to the other extreme I mean you're you've been in France for a long time but you've chosen to write about uh, about home no so um, tell, tell us what um, drew you to writing about life back home. Well I think that I was I mean I've just been thinking about this while I've been talking I guess and um, I did wonder whether because obviously you, you have this kind of disconnect between your old life and your new life and you can't help but imagine what that person you know you make this decision to come and live somewhere else what would you have done otherwise what kind of life what do you miss what don't you miss and I also find I have said to some people that there's Living in the UK, it's very much, um, when you step out of that and you come somewhere, well, quite rural, like I live in, um, you see that so much is driven in the UK by the idea of wanting more, wanting more, wanting more, and that's what keeps the kind of everything turning, everyone on their hamster wheels. And when I came over here, I realised I didn't have the sort of the distractions that I think had really helped me in many ways to feel quite happy you come away from all of that and you think you're just in this place and it's just you and your brain and you think oh hang on a minute um and it takes a while to kind of I, I feel like I've become myself over here because I had to fill that empty space that that space that was filled by work or I mean I work over here but it's it's for myself it's freelance so it's different and um, doing things and going places and there are places here to go but they you know they involve trees and grass and farmyard animals and things like that so you have to kind of you you fall back on your inner life and you think you know, who am I really and, and who was I and I sometimes describe to people like I've stepped out of the matrix and I'm looking back at it and I'm looking back at the way people live life in the UK for better and for worse and I think it allowed me to become an observer of life um, and maybe to see a little bit more humour in some of the some of the ways that we live and the different characters I've come across in working life and in de daily life before as well. So it's allowed me to have that distance and I think that's how really helped my observation and looking back at things and the way people are and the characters I've come across. And secondly, I mean, in Everything is Fine, um, it came about very much because when I moved across to France, it's 2009, and really Facebook was in its infancy, Twitter was not yet around, I don't think, certainly not for me anyway, not on my radar. And so I've lived over here and social media has grown and we all get a little bit of um, FOMO looking at people's photos. But I think when you're living in an in a area where there is nothing and You've got young children so you, you can't go out in the evenings anyway and you see people go to parties in the UK and you think oh I should be doing that what am I doing out here and I spoke to my sister about it and she said yeah but everyone knows that Facebook isn't real and that's really what inspired everything is fine because it's the idea that it doesn't matter who we are and we're all guilty of it including myself we decide what we project on social media whether it's 
really consciously we're trying to be an influencer and I don't want to show this but I want to show that or just because I like that bit of myself I like that photo I, I think we look like we we're having fun there and um, I suppose that it was that idea of reality versus what we project that really inspired the novel and whether I'd have been more immersed in it if I'd stayed in the UK I don't know but I suppose that's something that that stepping out of that environment and looking back is has given me in a way that's really interesting I love I love that idea of just you know having that space to be able to see the whole you know mm. uh, it's like what's the um, can't see the wood for the trees no <laughs> so yeah, then you step definitely. back and you go ah. <laughs> um no it's really fascinating and Natasha I mean your experience is a little different because you're was your book already written when, yes. the, when you moved to France? Yeah. Um, yeah we were. So obviously, yeah. you know, it's not connected to where you are. But what about what you're working on at the moment? Um, well, I mean, in fact, when I wrote the book, I wasn't even in America anyway. So I was always writing about something else, that a place where I wasn't. Right. So I tried this year to write about France. And it's really interesting because I, I speak French quite quite fluently. I'm a translator anyway. So languages are my thing. So... Um, yeah, I kind of thought, I mean, it feels very familiar to me here, even though I haven't been here that long. So I kind of thought, okay, well, like, I'm, I'm kind of on the inside a little bit. And we definitely met some French friends when we got here. Uh, but it's been a pandemic, you know, so it's been a really, really weird time to get to know people. I'm not sitting at their kitchen tables. You know, you're having a chat in the street. You're having a chat with a mask on but you're not really in inside life with people that much. So it's been really weird, but I did try. I started, oh God, I guess in the summer probably, I started a kind of, um, a kind of murdery story about an old lady in a house who was basically giving over bits of her memoir and diary. And through that, we were gonna find out some terrible story about her but I actually couldn't get that far because it ended up lapsing into all this sort of pandemic isolation loneliness in my attic with my many cats story and I was like you know what I can't I, I can't write that during a pandemic I'm gonna have to go somewhere else so I've actually gone completely AWOL um, and I've gone back to my own life 15 years ago and plumbing it plumbing my memories and just like completely plundering everything that's happened to me in New York City, you know, 20 years ago. So I'm not writing about France, but <clears throat> I do find that being in a country where the language around you being spoken is not the language that you're sort of thinking and writing in is incredibly um, freeing in a way because you can sort of let, because French isn't my first language, so I can let it babble around me and I can let, I can hear people talking, but I'm not really, I'm, I'm still, I, I'm having a private experience linguistically still. So I feel that there's a sort of privacy to it, but it's really hard for me to tell whether that's something more to do with the pandemic and the loneliness and the kind of isolated writerliness going on, uh, or if it's, it, I, it's hard to tell because I haven't lived in France, you know, for like 20 years. And even then that was only for a short time. Um, but I, I did take, it's funny, as I've been here, I, 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 Gillian was saying, and I, um, oh no, actually, I think it was Caroline saying, learning about the country as you get, 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 get used to being in a place. Because it occurred to me after about four or five months, I was like, I don't know about what prisons are like, like, and then I suddenly found out where all the the um, junkies hang out. And I was like, oh, the village, that car park and the village is full of junkies. And I was like, well, oh, they slowly, this whole other world, you know, the sort of beautiful little cute chalets and mountains and everything sort of recede. And this kind of real life sort of comes up gradually and the pettinesses and then getting shouted at by the farmer who everyone knew to avoid but I didn't know to avoid so um you know that has been actually um well kind of a joy in a way I mean it's been a really interesting sort of onion onion peel um phenomenon really for me yeah that's fascinating I have a, what about you Emma though tell us yeah well about you know, Barcelona in your book yeah, well, Barcelona is only mentioned. Um, I mean, it does play quite an important role in my book, I would say, but it's it. I don't um, really feature it apart from 
an apartment there. But the, the very first draft, but the very, 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 very first book that I ever wrote, which was a kind of the same story but different, was based in Guatemala. I was living in Guatemala at the time and, and, and my first novel that I completed was based in Guatemala um, and Mexico because I was also living there. And, and that's I got signed to my agent on, on this book about a Scottish aid worker in, in Guatemala. And um, it didn't sell, unfortunately. So then I wrote another one about a Scottish journalist in Mexico City. And it nearly sold, but didn't. And then so we scratched our heads and we said, what's what's the problem here? And then my agent said, I've got it. Why don't you try writing about Scotland? And honestly, it had never occurred to me to write about Scotland before. And I thought, OK, I'll, you know, I'll give it a try. So I created The Silent Daughter, which is about a news reporter in Edinburgh with a, a Spanish wife. So I still had the sort of the way in to, to, to the Spanish life. Um, and actually what I found, much to my surprise, was that I loved writing about Scotland. Um, you know, I've, I've really not lived in Scotland for a decade now. Um, you know, I, I quit my job in, as a journalist in, in 2009 um, to go to take one year out to travel and write a book. And I, I'm still on that one year out, uh, one decade later. Um, and, you know, and it really has been lovely to write about Scotland because I I do miss Scotland and some parts of it. And it's a kind of funny thing. I don't know whether everyone feels this about their own country, but um, I don't know, certainly like the mountains in Scotland and, and up north and, and Edinburgh, I, I a really special uh, sort of connection to those places. And I found that writing them was um, just very, very in, enjoyable. Um, uh, it was a little bit nerve wracking as well because I thought, you know, Scottish people are going to read this and they're going to say, oh, you know, like my mother, especially uh, sort of Edinburgh's that, that that you got that street wrong, you know, or, or you got that sort of landmark wrong. Um, and but you know, it it was it was fabulous to to do that. I think it was Robert Louis Stevenson who said, um, a, a Scottish person um, is never more proud of their nation um, than when they are not there, because uh, he he lived all over the place. I think he ended up in the Caribbean somewhere. Um, and I think that's happened to me, you know, I think the longer I spend out of Scotland, the, the in some ways, the more I love it. And so, you know, The, the Silent Daughter is based in Edinburgh, um, in the seaside suburb of Edinburgh called Portobello. And my, my next book, uh, Find Her First, um, will also be based there. And there isn't any Spain in that one at the moment. But what I do feel, um, and it's similar to, to what a couple of you have said, is, you know, I'm a tour guide in Spain and I love um, history and you know and the culture I love exploring um, just all these quirky aspects of Spanish life and telling them to my tour groups um, and now that you know since Covid came and I've not been working as a tour guide so I've not been giving lectures I've not been sort of showing people the culture I've not been exploring the same way that I usually do I've, I've had this urge to write about it and, and so I kind of feel like with my next book, with book three, I really, I would love to write about this as well. I mean, hopefully tourism will have returned by that point and I will be telling the stories. Um, but um, yeah, I do have the urge to write them down as well. And in some ways, um, ex further explore the Spanish culture and, and history through through my books. I think it's, it's a really, really very appealing. Um, so I just need to find the right story, the right characters to do that. But do you think, think you would use a, a, sta a Spanish person as your protagonist? Well, this is, I was, I was going to ask that as, as, as sort of my next question, because I think so far we have all got um, British protagonists, don't we? I think. I think it's difficult because of the language. I think if you have a Spanish person as a protagonist in Spain, they should speak Spanish. And it's going to be a bit weird if they're speaking English. That's what really why I mainly write about English characters. Yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. others disagree, but um, for me, I, I always, when I have a French person speaking, I always, it's either a sentence or two in French that's easy, or I justify why they can speak um, English well, because otherwise I think it's a bit strange, but that may, that may, be, that may just be me, I don't know. What, is it, what does everyone else think about that? I think you can get around that. I've got a few conversations in mind where my one of my English characters who does speak French is speaking in French to a 
Swiss person, but yeah, it's, yeah, all sure, in, it's all in English. But I but, but, but for the protagonist, if you've got that the whole time, I think it would be either quite tricky or quite wearing. The whole book, yeah, it probably would be. Yeah. So I did so, read, um, there's a book by um, Kate Riordan, The Heat Wave, which there's a lot in there where she's act technically speaking in French, but it's written in English. And I think it, I think it worked quite well. So I guess it just depends how you do it. I mean, yeah. fundamentally, um, so I'm a translator. Before I was a novelist, I was a translator of fiction. And um, I mean, if you're translating a French novel into English, everybody's going to be speaking English in the translation. It doesn't mean that they can't be located in the in the in the place though and it doesn't mean even that you can't use some of the sort of colloquial ticks of the French I mean if you if you're really writing a novel in France and all your characters are French the fact that they're speaking English for the book that's written in English doesn't really matter as long as the big the whole context is French if you're mixing then I think I think Catherine's point's interesting yeah my all, all the I mean my entire book my readers might be surprised about this but my entire book is actually written in Italian as as all of the dialogue is in Italian uh, because um, you know my 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 narrate my narrator um, he speaks fluent Italian so whenever he's speaking to Italians he's speaking in Italian and the Italians are speaking back to him in Italian and I only um, I, I don't think that there's, I don't think there's one point in book one, um, A Quiet Death in Italy, where anyone speaks any English whatsoever. Oh no, I tell a lie because he does speak English to his daughter. In fact, his daughter insists on speaking English to, to him. And she talks about the Italians, even though she herself is, is half Italian and speaks with, to everyone else in, in Italian. But, I, but when people do speak English, I make that clear. And right from the very beginning of the novel, I also make it clear that, you know, someone compliments him on his Italian or something. So it's very clear that the conversations are all happening in Italian. Um, so I think that if you kind of set the ground rules quite, quite clearly, then it can work. Um, I mean, you know, you read Elena Ferrante and her books are set in Naples. Um, and yeah, there are rhythms, and, and, and I try it very much, actually, not I hope, I hope too much, but enough to include the kind of rhythms of Italian um, and, and a few kind of Italianisms in, 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 in my books. Um, but, you know, you read Elena Ferrante, and she could be talking about, you know, two girls growing up in the, you know, in the suburbs of, of, you know, London or something like that. You know, you wouldn't necessarily know. Um, for the way that the language is spoken. So I, I think it's just about having clear ground rules, really. Mm. Uh. I, think it's a, I think it's a really interesting question, and it probably depends also on your own experience. I mean, uh, you know, in that country, I mean, I, in, in Spain, you know, my, my girlfriend is, is Spanish. All of my friends are Spanish. I spend all day speaking Spanish. I think in Spanish. Um, I actually sometimes when I go home to Scotland, I... I speak Spanish by accident to my parents, which is the weirdest thing. Um, but I would never write a book in Spanish. But in, ter and in terms, so I, fe I do feel like, like I do profoundly understand Spanish people, but I still don't know if I would be qualified to, 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 to write, or I don't know if I would feel qualified to, to write a book from a completely Spanish point of view. I don't know, it's a very interesting question. Um, just, sorry, sorry, Emma, sorry. No, that, I, I was kind of done. No, I was going to say, I, I sort of deliberately decided not to have my detective be an Italian detective um, because, you know, you do, you do have writers who, you know, like uh, Donna Leon and, and, and so on, who, who have um, Italian detectives and, you know, all respect to them. Um, but I didn't actually think that I was qualified to do that. And I didn't want to have a bash at that. And I thought that it would actually be more interesting for the reader to have the experience of the foreigner viewing the country as a foreigner, but as a foreigner, a kind of an insider outsider sort of perspective. Um, and, you know, all my friends, well, yeah, almost all my friends here are Italian. My family here is Italian. And, and I think it was my specific experience of the kind of seamy side of Italian life and not being given any sort of, uh, I don't know, concessions or anything like that for being a foreigner, just having to get on with it and having to deal with, 
you know, um, quite a lot of challenging situations and the police and all sorts of other sorts of also all, all sorts of other business. I kind of almost forgot, um, in a sense, that I was different in that sense. And so I suppose that gave me the confidence to sort of throw myself into this into this Italian world. Although, you know, you know, the police officers that that uh, Daniel comes across. Um, in in both books really i suppose do bear more than a passing resemblance to the police officers i came across when i was working you know for the Met police in the 1990s you know mm. <laughs> so so there are a lot, lot there, there are lots of sort of fusions and similarities but um mm. it's, it's a bit interesting i mean i think uh, it, it, it's, it's um it's interesting to see how in many many ways the, the, the sense of place, you know, the, the place that you are, you know, has affected or impacted all of our writings in, in very distinct ways, actually. Um, now, in terms of our sort of non-writing career, uh, the actual writing process, in terms of the, the rest of what it's like being a writer, um, I think it'd be interesting to talk about that. We actually have a question on the chat, and sorry, I did mean to say at the start, if any of you have a question, uh, for any of the panellists or for all of us, you can drop a question in the Q&A box, which is just along the bottom, and we will definitely get to them. Um, so what I wanted to talk about now was, you know, all of us um, are debut novelists. We were all published in 2020, apart from Caroline, who was 2021. So we published during the pandemic, um, you know, and obviously for the majority of people on earth this was you know work-wise not a good thing um but i think perhaps for writers living abroad it's been in some ways quite positive certainly my experience has been that if i had been published in 2020 and it was a normal year i i really feel strongly that i would not be um so integrated into the british writing community as i am and basically that is because of Zoom and because of all these, you know, enormous efforts yeah. made by writers all over the place to try and connect and, and, and you know, promote ourselves and promote our books and just to connect with other writers because none of us were able to leave our house. So I think certainly my experience of publishing in the pand pandemic has been remarkably positive uh, on the whole. And I wonder if that's something that you all feel, that a view that you all share. Gillian, I think you're nodding your head. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that I think that I'm I'm quite geared up for my my forthcoming publication because I think we've all been on quite a steep learning curve, haven't we? Including our publishers, because when things began to just sort of drop away in in my, my book was published in the May and in the February, a lot of plans were made <laughs> that I was looking forward to, like a, a, an actual real book launch. And then I think that I felt like in the May, the world was still in shock. I mean, I was still in shock. I, I felt quite strange saying anything about my book being published. It's just little things, but you can't go, oh, I'm, I'm so excited about my book because the world was falling apart. And I don't think any of us really knew, well, we still don't, but we got used to not knowing what's, what's going to happen next. And um, so the actual book publication, I feel that was greatly affected and quite negatively by the pandemic. Um, but the kind of becoming an author and stepping into that, that sort of role, um, as far as I have, has been quite positive for the reasons that you've said, um, Emma, because you're right, I think all, if all events, I mean, the, the playing field in terms of events like this, for example, is, is level, isn't it? Um, whereas people who enjoy things in real life um, might not really investigate what it could be like to come to an event that was virtual and now I think that people are much more open to that I mean it's that or nothing at the moment but I think that there will be a legacy that these sorts of events will continue because they do and, and I read something about um, one of the writing festivals I can't remember which one but it did virtual and it's going to keep an aspect of its um, offering next time virtual. And there was a lot of people saying, 
they felt excluded, not necessarily writers, some writers, some attendees, readers, whatever, from that kind of inner circle of, of being at a festival, being able to afford to go to a festival, find the time to go to a festival, travel, stay somewhere. And I think that it's just opened everything up in that way. And that can only really be a positive thing because you don't have to, to sit at your screen and watch this or any other event. You don't have to feel that you fit in to a certain bracket or that you're the type of person that does this. You can try it. Um, and so it does mean that, yeah, we've, we've probably reached more readers in that way, in that very kind of personal way. And I also feel that, I don't know, from a writer, from connecting with other writers, I mean, I don't think we'd probably know each other in the way that we do now, because we're all on, from a group, aren't we, that they are kind of struggling through 2020 together and wondering what on earth is going on. And that has, yeah, it, it's not, I'm, I'll never say, oh, I'm so happy that I was published in a pandemic, but I, I think when time moves on, I'll see more and more the benefits um, and I think I've got braver online than I would have been otherwise. And I've contacted authors I wouldn't have dared to kind of even poke online before because you're left with that and um, you, you give it a go, don't you? So, yeah, sort of a bit of both for me. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, um, you know, yeah, to have, as you say, the, 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 the disappointments as well as the, the, the benefits. I mean, absolutely. Um, what about your experience, Catherine Cooper? How, how has it been? Um, so was, I'm not sure I entirely disagree. I, I understand what Gillian's saying, but um, I was really, really looking forward to things like, um, because um, well, as all of us, I think, probably know who live in Europe, um, until the pandemic, it was very easy to pop on a Ryanair flight and get back to the UK very cheaply and easily. Obviously, all that's gone, even if you ignore the um, quarantine and all the other issues you have, tests and all the other things you have to go. And obviously, anyway, you can't have a party. Um, so I was disappointed that I couldn't couldn't have a launch party. In fact, when my book was actually um, released in November, we were actually locked down here in France as well. And I think it was actually probably one of our biggest lockdowns. Um, so it was literally just me, my husband and my daughter. But we had fireworks in the garden anyway. Um, but I've um, I'm always, as you may have noticed anyway, I'm I've always been quite big online anyway I love being online I spend a lot of time online anyway and I know obviously I have really enjoyed um, being part of our group and things but I think I would have done that anyway um, I think it's nice to have both um, it's nice to have the online thing particularly as most of us as writers spend all our day online so it's nice to have the company um, but I'm a freelance journalist again like a lot of you and um, so again I'm used to spending my day online and I'm used to chatting to other people online and I've always done that um, but I, yeah, I would have been really keen to go back and um, have a party and go to events. I'm still hoping to go to Harrogate this um, this year, but again, depends on the quarantine rules and all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, they have. I mean, I, again, I look, the other thing was I was lucky in that my book was in supermarkets, so um, obviously a lot of people were very impacted by. Um, by the bookshops being closed, um, for me, it wasn't such a big deal because I was lucky and, and got into supermarkets. Um, so, yeah, I'm still kind of really holding out for real life events because the other thing is I'm, I just, I'm not a massive Zoom fan. I do the odd one of these, but um, I don't do too many because for me, it's not the same. So it's better than nothing, but it's um, I'm looking forward to the real life events. Yeah. And do you know what? My question for, for Caroline and Tasha, I've got a hard question for you. Uh, what's going to happen after the pandemic? I mean, obviously, at some point, you know, as Catherine said, we used to just pop home, you know, 28 quid and you're back in London or back in Glasgow or whatever. Um, you know, that's what I had organised for my launch. I was going home. I had a hotel for a couple of nights with my parents and then I was going to come back. Um, what do you think is going to happen once... You know, um, I don't want to say once the pandemic is over, because I know it's something that worldwide is, is going to keep going. But once it's safe to travel, safe and, and easy to travel within Europe again, um, what do you think will happen to these kind of events? Uh, I mean, they've become such a huge part of my life. I had never Zoomed in my life before this. Um, and I actually, Catherine, I, re I really love it. Um, I, I just, I, I really enjoy it. And I know it's not, you know, um, it's not the same as being in, in, in a, in a, 
bookshop or lodge or whatever but I really do enjoy them and I think if they suddenly just stop I'm like oh what am I going to do two nights a week <laughs> do you know <laughs> although the, the bars will be open again and restaurants um but what do you think I mean well to what extent do you think it will continue uh currently I really hope it does continue um I think I'm a mixture of Gillian and Catherine obviously I really want to I haven't been to the UK since last March so what 13 14 months and I, I really want to go now I'd love to see my book in a bookshop I'd love to meet up with friends and family and maybe have a bit of a gathering but um I'm not a big one for sort of big parties and I think the the idea I was I had a zoom launch which actually was lovely and I think actually the idea of being in a a bookshop with lots of people and stuff I would find probably more intimidating than doing something like this and also like Gillian said I think this it it opens up, it makes it a level level playing field that lots of people can attend an event like this and participate as authors. So I really hope that continues because I think it's a, um, yeah, a really nice thing. Um, and, and although I do want to pop back and if I got invited to a real life festival, I'm sure I'd, I'd love to go. Um, but you can't do that all the time. You know, it's, it is relatively cheap to fly back, but you, you know, you don't want to go back every week kind of thing. So I think this kind of event just makes it a bit more possible to do it more frequently. What about you, Natasha? What's your thoughts on the future of book events? I think it'll, I think there'll be a lot online. I think there'll be a way more online than there was, even when things, even if things immediately got back to normal this summer for some by some miracle. I'm pretty sure that there's so much more accessibility for people. I mean, how, how many of us are sitting in I don't know major cities in Britain? Um, able to go to book launches and lectures and series and reading series. It doesn't, no, I mean, I'm I'm not even really able to do that in my normal life, actually. Not to the extent to which you need to, like, to, when you're getting a book out, the extent to which you sort of want to, like, race around. I'm watching a friend of mine in America whose book's coming out, and she's in her car riding around the country, or her state at least, um, stopping at every bookshop she can stop in, sleeping in a car, sleeping in a motel. I mean, actually, my life doesn't quite allow me to do that, um, that kind of thing. So online is is going to be really important for me. I'm hoping to be a bit less online because I'm really quite a lot online. I mean, I, you know, I really lead a really isolated life here. So basically, I'm on Twitter and like many hours a day um and I'm just and just just to talk to people or to chat or to find out something or to feel a stray moment um and like you said zoom I mean I've been able to take part in a course at the Irish Writing Centre which I never would have done you know wouldn't it it wouldn't have been available and I think that it's probably for most places they'll want to keep it up I think they'll or they'll like for example if they're ever going to do a reading in a big famous bookshop in London they probably put it online as well for people to watch whereas before I don't think they really did that so I think we're gonna it won't be quite as much as this but I think it's gonna stay you know people are working from home people are decentralizing I think the the new community that's kind of drummed itself up around books will you know will I think something like 70% of it I have a feeling will kind of remain Mm -hmm. and anyway I'm hoping so because it yeah like you I'd feel really weird to get disengaged from this amazing thing that we've built not least in our debuts group but you know broadly across social media and on zoom and of course the the festival that we're all taking part in has been hugely successful the stay at home Mm. festival Mm. Uh, you know and and it's amazing when you look at the program the number of events you know and I'm flicking through them and saying like there's so many things I want to attend and like you say being in Barcelona unless I was flying home you know often there's no way I would be able to attend so I think it has so many positives and we've, we've got a couple of comments in the chat actually um Rosalind Russell says that um from a reader's point of view, it has also been marvellous to attend so many festivals and encounter writers like all of us, who she may not have come across what, uh, otherwise. Um, and also, she says it's the Edinburgh Book Festival that is going to do both virtual and face-to-face events. Yeah. And another okay. uh, viewer, Kath Ashley, Kathy Ashley, says she's attended dozens of literary events and workshops that she would never have been able to go to in person. So I think, yeah, both for readers... And for writers, you know, it does create a whole a whole lot of um, new opportunities. Um, obviously, you know, it would be great. Uh, I've got my tickets for Harrogate as well, Catherine. 
um, <laughs> with the free cancellation on the hotel just in case. I think, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, it's funny though. I mean, I think in my, I've only actually been to like a couple of book festivals ever in my life. Just again, partly because of the expense, partly because of the travel, partly because I thought, oh, I don't know anyone. I don't really know what goes on. And, you know, it, it was just always quite intimidating. But now I think, you know, it, it would be much more accessible. I think it will be very odd if we all do go to a book festival and we're all there because we'll suddenly see each other in person and I'll, I'll recognise everyone, even though I've never <laughs> met any, anyone, you know. It'll be quite bizarre. Um, now, I'm just looking at the time. We're, we're coming close to nine o'clock and we do have a few questions. Um, so let's have a look at the questions. There's one uh, for Tom. Tom, do we need to learn Italian to understand the dialogue in your book? Fortunately, no. <laughs> no, but I did. I did. I did wonder. I did wonder uh, if perhaps I might be misunderstood a little. Um, but uh, but no, it's all in English. I, I I promise. There are only a few Italian words, and I think, in fact, one. I think I, I noticed one reviewer on Amazon said, "You don't have to keep on translating all of the Italian. You know, we should know that." So uh, so yeah. So there's just a few lines. So don't Excellent. worry. About that. Okay, doc. And we have another uh, question. How many of you are relying completely on your writing to make a living? Put your hand up. <laughs> uh, I think novel writing, <laughs> no, but but freelance writing plus novel writing, yes. Um, yeah, me, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I do. I do a little bit of teaching, but um, yeah, mainly like I think like Gillian, yeah, the novels and the um, journalism. Oh, and a bit of copywriting as well. Copywriting, but you, Caroline, you're the same. No, you're a journalist as well. Yeah, well, I do more sort of copywriting and editing and things now. Um, yeah, so but that definitely alongside novel writing. And to Tom and Natasha, are you similar? Yeah, I mean freelancing, and uh, you know, I, I don't think that um, I think it's a very brave individual indeed who who kind of goes into to novel writing expecting to, to earn, earn a living out of it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and same, same. I, I, I write book reviews a lot, um, but those don't pay that well either. And I write other kinds of essays and short stories that I get sold. But um, last year, I had an amazing project. I got contacted by Penguin to do um, to um, pronounce Russian names for the reader of an audiobook. And I got the most extraordinarily generous sum for it. And I was like, <laughs> wow, I just read out a few names and you are willing to pay me for that. That's amazing. That's um, so, you, I mean, I'll you speak Russian, Russian. Russian. Natasha, you speak Russian? Yes. Yeah, that's my, I translate normally Russian fiction into English. Oh, okay. Um, wow. Though I'm not Russian, even though my name is Natasha. Hmm. Okay. So how come you learned the Russian? I learned it at university and then I just kind of it sort of and I went and lived there and it, one thing led to another and I started translating. Brilliant. That's brilliant what a fantastic opportunity. Um, to answer that question I'm a, I'm a tour guide and tour director um, so obviously my other job completely disappeared um, you know my my job is uh, taking small groups of uh, of Americans uh, around France, Spain and Portugal and you know I was on tour leading a group when the when the lockdown happened and had to very quickly ship uh, ship them all home and then get the last train back to Barcelona before we went into lockdown so for me it's been very odd you know my my, my tour guiding career collapsed basically in, in March 2020 uh, and my novel was but it was actually just when I was starting my edits. So then I was completely free to work on my edits. My novel came out in September. I was offered another book deal and I've had the whole year free to write the book. So it's actually been kind of ideal. Um, and curiously, my company has now launched um, online tours. Uh, and because I've been doing so many online events, I've, I've now been contracted as an online presenter uh, for these online programs that they're running. So it's great. So it's kind of combining... Um, both things. So I'm a tour guide online, which is an unusual concept. Um, <laughs> and uh, don't get the nice hotels and the nice uh, and the nice meals, but you know it's 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 great. So I think all of this combined, basically, don't we? A bit of writing and a bit of um, other stuff. And to be honest, I I, I certainly um, I feel that I, I enjoy having another job. Uh, I think you know it's been fantastic this year having 
almost a full year dedicated to writing. But I do feel like I do miss those two months or two or three months a year when my head is in a different place, when I'm lecturing about history and I'm meeting groups and I'm being super sociable and I'm, you know, and traveling around. I, I, I do miss the break uh, that, you know, that, that gives my brain. I don't know how the rest of you feel about that in terms of, you know, I think the dream is often to be a full time writer, but actually uh, after having a year of it, I think I, I like having another job. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I agree. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I, I mainly do travel journalism, so again, that's kind of fallen away and I'm missing, equally, I'm missing my lovely hotels and lovely meals, so I'm kind of waiting for that to come back too. Yeah, no, but too. Even, even the famous Russian writer Anton Chekhov said that he couldn't write if he, hasn't, if he wasn't already also a doctor, he was a doctor. So, and those were great, um, great uh, professions that sort of helped each other. He, he felt very much that it was important to have two things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's see what other questions we have. Um, Kathy Ashley, Ashley's asking, what were the pitfalls of representing a people, country and culture other than your own? And what steps have you taken to address them? And how is that manifested in your writing? sort of pitfalls or challenges of representing a people, country and culture that wasn't your own. Anyone want to answer that? Yeah. Caroline? Yeah, I can give it a go. <laughs> go on, Caroline, you start. Um, that's quite a big question. I th and that was something I was quite worried about because, as I said, um, my book very much looks at issues to do with Switzerland that are not, not your stereotypical cows and chocolate and it's really about these um about women's rights and uh, about this um issue within the foster care system two issues which are i guess not controversial but um you know a bit darker than what you might think of as switzerland so yeah i was really concerned about accuracy about i mean it's fiction my book is fiction my characters are fictitious but i really wanted the historical context to be accurate so um yeah i spent a lot of time researching and then fact checking and then double fact checking and triple fact checking um and I spoke to um uh well I read books by written by experts and then I managed to speak to the author of one of the books just to sort of quadruple check that <laughs> the the things that I was saying were were correct um but at the same time I think you then have to let that simmer in the background and write the the fictional story that you want to write um so it's sort of almost separating those two things but making sure they work in harmony mm. what about you tom yeah um because you know basically i'm describing um talking about uh, italy and and also the seamy side of italy um from an outsider's perspective i was very sensitive to to that and um i think i received more i, I don't know people tend to take it a bit strangely but mostly British people, you know, I have people that, you know, really love the way that I've represented Italy and, you know, and I've had reviewers, you know, in, in, in the press and, you know, on the forums who have said, oh, you know, clearly the writer, you know, loves the country, loves the city, it comes through his writing. And I've had other people say, this guy must really hate this place. <laughs> um, and um, I had um, a couple of Italian um, readers read through it, who are obviously, you know, actually linguists who are fluent in in English read through it and I and I and I asked them you know to check and, and how they felt about my representation of their country because you know I wanted to ensure that you know I was sort of getting it right and I wasn't I really didn't want to write under the Tuscan sun with murders you know I really didn't want to write this kind of you know this isn't it, the sun's always shining and there's these kind of quirky characters I wanted to because I was inspired by, you know, a, a, a factual book called Night Naples 44, um, which was written in the, you know, during the war, and it was written by a British journalist describing his experience in Naples. And I sort of wanted to do the same for, uh, that's Norman Lewis, and I sort of wanted to do the same for the, the, the modern day reader. So I, I felt that I had, a, I had to kind of maintain a sort of journalistic integrity, even though I was writing fiction. Um, and yeah, um, there, there have been there was there was one interesting comment by 
um, an Italian reviewer, uh, a reader, reviewer, and, um, and it was interesting. She gave the book four out of five stars and said, you know, you'll be shocked if you read this and da 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 da, his representation of Italy is not the Italy that I know and so on. And, uh, but it's, you know, it, drag, it, it draws you in and so on and so forth. So I think people, even Italian readers have ambiguous feelings about it. And then I was quite disappointed to, to note when I came back to, to, to read the, some other reviews of it later, she'd, she'd knocked it down to three stars. So <laughs> she obviously thought that because she had like kind of given me a critical review, she, even though she loved the book, she had to sort of like uh, demonstrate that. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, but I feel pretty confident. Um, another inspiration for me actually was the Italian writer, Beppe Servignini, who, who, uh, who was the, 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 um, I think the, the, the correspondent for Corriere della Sera in, in the UK. And he kind of wrote uh, books about the, the Italians for an Anglo-Saxon audience and, the Ita uh, uh, and talked about Britain for the Italian audience. And I kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps as well a bit. So, so I, I, I was quite careful, I, I hope, to, to get the, the facts right, but also to kind of put a bit of a spin on it as well, to give people a bit of a laugh or, or what have you. Mm. So we've got another yeah. question. Which, oh, I was say, we have another question which relates to that um, from uh, Alyssa, saying, you know, what has the what has the local reception been to your book? Do people have opinions on whether you've got it right or wrong, or how do you feel about how do people feel about seeing their cultures represented by outsiders? I mean, you, um, that's an interesting one. I think for all of us, in a way, though, because you know, for example, Catherine, yours is about the expat community. Um, um, yeah, that, that one's not out yet, so um, we'll have to see how the um, experts feel about it. Uh, but, yeah, um, no, because I, it could be... Is it, is it I, imagine, yeah, I imagine there'll be some people who'll say, oh, that's definitely me, and it won't be. You know, they're all, they're all um, kind of... But, you know, yeah, they are... And, yeah, I mean, like both the books, the, the characters aren't particularly nice, so, yeah, the expat community <laughs> may not particularly like it, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> um, but the other one, um, again, it's, it's very much... Uh, it's it's a holiday point of view and it's people on holiday so um i don't think there's much to offend the french in it but um it's it's due to come out in france i think later this year so um we'll see what they think um but you know i think it's very much just a depiction of a, a ski resort and it's generally very apart from the murders obviously it's generally very positive <laughs> um there's nothing nothing too offensive in it so um it's not i'm not like um I, you know, I'm not writing about the senior side of France, really. I'm just writing about people living their lives in an ordinary way, and particularly in ski resorts, in a quite a privileged and, um, you know, um, lucky way, really. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, it's not something that's so far been a big issue, but we'll see when they come out in France. Mm. It's quite interesting. I mean, I found, uh, because I was writing about Edinburgh, I was really nervous about what people in Edinburgh would think about my depiction of it. And I have to say, I, I, I've, I've loved... Um, you know, I've had a few emails from readers who've said that they love my depiction of Edinburgh and it's just like the biggest relief. <laughs> I was like, thank goodness. I, I have, with, with, um, with the um, expat one, I have deliberately um, said that the I've given the area, it's a fictionalised name. It's, it's very much a sort of fictionalised version of where I live. So if anyone complains about it, say, well, it's not here anyway. So, you know, whatever. If that's yeah. how you read it, it's, you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about here. Yeah, I did. I actually did the same. I have a a little village in my town where in my book, uh, which is completely invented, um, because I needed a specific type of geography that um, that didn't exist near Edinburgh. So I just had yeah, to exactly. kind of it's invent like, yeah. it. Mine's called yeah. the Chateau. There aren't there aren't many Chateaux where I live at all. But um, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, it's a kind of made up um, yeah. um, sort of amalgam of various places in France. Uh, it's a good way of good way of getting around it. Um, I mean, I actually find that what is really is useful if you're not in the place you're writing about to um, to look up YouTube videos of it and remind yourself what the street furniture looks like, like the benches and the lampposts, just to give yourself that kind of, if you know, just to because you need the details if and if they're not forthcoming. I mean, the, when I wrote my book, I felt that because I haven't lived in America for about 12 years. I think some of my details were a little old, actually. I think they weren't, like, I think it's people were like, they don't really wear jeans like those anymore. And I was like, oh, whoops, okay, whoops. <laughs> you know, like, I, was, I had to update my, my memory bank a bit before I managed it. But anyway, that's just a, 
an adjacent thought. Mm. No, it's, 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 it's a very interesting. I think you're going to say something, Gillian. Sorry. Well, I was, I was just going to link um, to Natasha just to say that I've had a couple of things that I've written about the UK corrected because I've been slightly out of date. Um, like one of my people got on a bus and was fiddling about with change, and she was saying, no, 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 my editor's like, no one really uses change on a bus anymore. So I had to change that. I mean, obviously, um, in some respects, I haven't been back to the UK since 2018. We were going to have a big trip in 2020. Um, but some experiences that I've had in the UK that I might draw on are, are very old, I guess, uh, like going on a bus. I haven't been on a bus in the UK probably for, I don't know, 20 years at least. And uh, so I suppose it can happen that your even your knowledge of, of somewhere that you feel that you know inside out can change very quickly. Yeah, no, in fact, my copy editor picked up a huge mistake in mine. Um, which was I had smoking shelters outside the hospital <laughs> and uh, she was like no 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 <laughs> these no longer exist you go to the hospitals in, in Spain and if, like pretty much the doctors are smoking at the front door you know <laughs> so I had various scenes where you know the main character goes outside for a cigarette and like absolutely no way this would happen he'd have to walk a mile away from the hospital to have his cigarette in edinburgh so i changed it to cups of tea um, but, th but those are the kind of things that you know I, like you say jillian we, we, we think we know our own country inside out but i think it's impossible to get everything absolutely right um whatever you're writing about we have another question asking uh, all of us if our novels have been translated into the languages of the country where we live and if so what has the reader's reception been has anyone got that experience my mine is being yeah the chat is being translated it hasn't been yet i'm not exactly sure when it's happening but i believe it should be out i, well, I assume it'll come out in winter um so i'm guessing later this year so i'm really excited about that and my rather sweetly my daughter's really pleased because it means her friends can read it Ah, great. Excellent. Anyone else got the foreign translation? Not yet, no. Not yet. Not yet. We're all hopeful. Um, okay, I think for the moment that is the questions we've got. So I've got one more question for all of us before we um, before we tie this up. Um, we're, we're all Brits abroad. Um, and really, I suppose, just to finish the, the, the chat, I mean, it's been really fascinating to hear everyone's different experiences, uh, both about the writing process and the sort of uh, the community that, that, that we live within and the reactions to that. Um, but if you had to choose the sort of the single best thing about being a British writer abroad, what's, what, what is it that, that makes it for you, that makes it stand out? Um, whoever wants to answer that. I can answer from a... a perspective, slightly freelance writery type perspective, in that I, I've written, written a lot of very personal opinion pieces, and I know that when I walk down the street, no one that I see is probably going to have read them. <laughs> Makes me a bit more able to talk about my life um, in, in a very personal way. Um, and I guess maybe if I knew that I was going to be in a magazine and half the mums at the school gate were going to have read it, I might be a bit more inhibited. So <laughs> I guess that's one, one good thing for me. <laughs> that's really interesting. I, I guess, I guess, yeah. Similarly, not from the novel point of view, really, but from my travel journalism point of view, it means I get to um, review lots of lovely French hotels. Mm, that must be lovely. Excellent. Not Caroline, mine, not mine. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think for me, it's just being able to be in this lovely countryside and, you know, do my novel thinking time while I'm swimming in the lake or hiking up a mountain. Like, really, I think. There's just so many nice places to go. And for me, the thinking time is so much a part of creating a novel. Um, and I've got lots of that, lots of nice places to do that out here. Yeah. Are you having the space as well? It's, it's lovely being able to sit outside yeah. on the laptop. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's really nice. Brilliant. What about you, Tom? Um, <laughs> I, I appeared in um, the local paper and um, and uh, I, I, there, there was an interview in a local paper, you know, it was Scotland Yard comes to Bologna or what have you. And, um, and all of a sudden I was like a celebrity on my street. You know, the, the lady from the butchers was running after me, waving the newspaper <laughs> and things like that. And, you know, which, which was sweet, you know, because uh, it's probably about, about, about as big a celebrity I'll have, as I'll ever be. Um, but also I do think that um, in Italy, uh, not again that this is something that I particularly um, am, am interested in, um, 
but I think they take writers a lot more seriously than they do in the UK. You know, in the in the UK, I, I think is a bit sort of like, oh, well, when are you going to get a proper job or something? Um, in 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 Italy, you know, to have published a novel, and you know, my my novel was actually in English, but in the bookshops here, you know, they look at you like, you know, you're a proper intellectual. <laughs> How little they know, but but, it, 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 but it's but it's uh, but it's quite it's quite sweet. It's quite a nice quite a nice thing. Mm. Great. What about you, Natasha? You know, I find it just really, in a really geeky way, really exciting to be in another language. I was just on my way to, uh, on my way home today, listening to the radio, and this man was talking about his, his ability to cry so easily, and he called it his lacrimal tendencies in French. And I was like, that's so, that's just so amazing what the French language can do. It's sort of such a different way of thinking about eyes and their tendencies and I thought it just excites me I, I find this just really fun even though it doesn't probably help me it probably scrambles my English but <laughs> it's exciting anyway <laughs> yeah I mean I think for me kind of a combination of what you've all said I mean uh, I, I've all you know I moved to Barcelona as soon as I graduated from university and, and was a teacher and didn't enjoy that at all so I left and I kept sort of um, trying to find ways to move back to Barcelona and be able to do the job I wanted to do but then I became a news reporter so I went there and back to Scotland and things and, and for me it's just amazing to be able to live exactly where I want to live and and, and you know and, and do the job that I want to be doing and I do also find it just constantly inspiring you know there's so all these little details like the ones Tom talks about in his book just these little very very European or very very Spanish things that just are constantly inspiring and even if I don't write about them it's just I think it's great because your your brain never quite, well, certainly my my brain never quite falls into the same rut because I'll turn a corner and there's like 28 people queuing up for a loaf of bread because this is the best baker on the street. And I'm just like, what? This I'm not, this is, I feel at home, but this is not like home. You know, and it's just these constant sort of reminders of different ways of living and different kinds yeah, there's, of people. There's always and, something that's a bit different even when you've been there for 10 years. There's always something you just think, oh yeah, okay, that's, yeah, not yeah, the same as yeah, me. Like, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic and just endlessly inspiring. And again, the nature, it, you know, Barcelona, I'm so close to the mountains and the sea. And that's that for me, again, is for the thinking time um, is, is really important. Uh, so I know um, Gillian, Caroline and Catherine and Natasha, you're all rural. No, you're all out in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Or no, you're, you're in the city. Yeah. You're in the city. And, and you're in the city, Tom, as well. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're three city cities writers and, and three country writers but you know I think probably although it's the, it is the cliche the good weather I think is also <laughs> a bonus yeah. uh, true. I miss I miss you you say the food Natasha I, I the, the, the one well apart from you know obviously my, my 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 family and my friends the one thing I really miss is the British food can you believe that really yeah yeah I, I, I miss I miss British humour that's what I miss most I think I mean, this is me, I mean, because food, I couldn't actually. get back to the UK, I had to make my own mince meat for mince pies this Christmas. I mean, from <laughs> scratch, it was the weirdest experience. I was like, oh my God. Uh, it's so funny, these little things that we miss. But I think um, overall, oh, hang on, we, I think another question has just come in. Um, yeah, we've just got a quick one. Yeah, we've got time for one more question, actually, before we tie it up. Valerie Waterhouse is saying, um, some of you live in fairly isolated circumstances, so how do you keep going? Uh, how did you keep going with your writing when you had doubts? Or did you not have doubts? I actually think it's easier in an isolated circumstance because you have less, fewer distractions. Like, uh, my, um, my second book was written in France's first lockdown because there was literally nothing else to do and I wasn't allowed more than one kilometre from my house and like the children didn't need to go take him to school and I had no travel journalism to do I could just get on with it so it's actually really easy mm. I actually think um, yeah being isolated is it actually makes it makes life easier as a writer in many ways mm. um, for me I I think that I do um I'm a doubting person I doubt myself all the time and I have been confident and I doubt myself and I don't think the thing about writing is, I suppose, it's very personal, isn't it? And it, even if you were living, you know, cheek against jowl with thousands of people, they won't have read your book. And so 
I think the doubts come, you know, they're in your head and they'll go wherever you do if they're there at the time. So um, I sort of understand that, it, that I guess there's not so many distractions here and, and that can be difficult. And it's something I struggled with, not from a writing point of view, just in terms of mental health when I first came out here, because it's just you and your thoughts. And it's okay when your thoughts are good, but if your thoughts are kind of having a bad day, then there's no escape. Um, but I learned to live with myself and kind of get to know myself, I think, over here. And, um, you know, I have a husband to nag when it really gets too much. And other than that, he just takes it all, basically. So <laughs> maybe I should ask him what it's like. <laughs> um, any more final questions before we tie it up? Um... Oh, hang on. No, no I think we're, we're all done. Does anyone get any final comments before we before we close the panel? Any of the panel members? If, if not, I think we all I think we all get to hold up our books again. Um, and I'll say a, a huge thanks to Tom Benjamin in Italy, Gillian Harvey somewhere in a field in France, Caroline Bishop in Lausanne in Switzerland, Catherine Cooper in a mountain. In France, Natasha Randall, I'm not entirely sure where, but also in France. Uh, Emma Christie in Barcelona. Um, thank you so much to all the people who've come along. We've had almost 30 people joining us tonight, so that's been absolutely brilliant. And hope you've all enjoyed um, our insights into life, uh, writing and being a writer in uh, Europe. So thank you so much and take care and enjoy all the rest of the Stay at Home Festival events. Uh, there's many, many more to enjoy. So 